must go faster. Today is Sunday, January 30th. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. This video was supposed to be released earlier today, but after all, it is football night in America. And despite my giant ego, I cannot compete with football. So I hope everybody enjoyed the games. And now that we're done, you're going to watch the second most popular show in America. But what a game. Cincinnati, Kansas City. Cincinnati won. And this is called momentum. When you beat all the odds. And perhaps this is a leading indicator that Cincinnati will win the Super Bowl. And if they don't, I'm going to stop making football predictions. I'm going to stick the stock market. Speaking of, we got a long subject ahead of us. And folks, once again, I got a good one for you tonight. And let's dive right into it. Here it is. In focus tonight. The Wall of Worry. And you know it's serious when we bring out the Wall of Worry. The items that we have in the Wall of Worry. Number one, the brothel in Washington, D.C. Number two. China, number three, Russia, number four, the hawkish Federal Reserve, and lastly, uh, the thing, and of course, the not in order. Let's start by the brothel in Washington, D.C., and how it relates to the stock market. The stock market has been pricing at least a two and a half trillion dollars worth of build back better plan. And of course, it appears, at least for now, we're not going to get shit, nothing. And therefore, the stock market has to price out at least two and a half trillion dollars worth of fiscal spending. And this failure revolves around the de facto president of the United States, Senator Joe Manchin, who keeps changing his mind by the day. One day he wants this, the other day he doesn't want that, and he goes over and over and over again. Now, don't get me wrong, I am a critic of the Build Back Better plan it is a disaster from a fiscal perspective, and it will push inflation higher. However, inflation is crushing the poor and the middle class the most, and it's not their fault, and we have to compensate the poor for the cost of inflation. They have absolutely nothing to do with this inflation. Inflation was born due to the reckless policies of the Fed printing trillions of dollars out of thin air, all to prop up the equities and real estate markets, aka the assets of the rich, to make the rich richer. And now all of a sudden we have a problem. It's called inflation. Should the poor bear the burden of this crisis? Of course not. But Senator Manchin has his priorities, and by priorities we mean cash from the billionaires. The likes of Ken Longhorn and uh, Nelson Peltz, the sponsors of this guy. And of course Biden tried to call his old boss Obama and Oprah to convince Joe Manchin to change his mind, and he is not going to change his mind. In the meantime, while the blue cult and the red cult fight against each other, a matter of fact, the blue cult fighting within the country is in shambles. The state of infrastructure in this country is shameful. Take a look at what happened on Friday in Pittsburgh. Following this breaking news, a bridge collapsed near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This is a live look at that snowy scene with all the emergency crews there. The collapse happened this morning. 
Firefighters say at least 10 people did suffer minor injuries. So we want to show you this image that came into our newsroom showing the devastation and the damage there. Some of the cars that were on the road at the time. There's one there you can see in the distance. The heavy snow too. Crews say that weather did play a factor in their response time. It's very frightening. I mean, goodness, all these um, ambulances and fire trucks and whatnot. Just the thought of the bridge collapsing is a very scary prospect. I cross that bridge all the time. President Biden is supposed to travel to Pennsylvania today to talk about infrastructure. And at the same time, two of the leading three Democrats on the statewide ballot there say that they have scheduling conflicts. They cannot meet with him. It's kind of a growing trend that's been happening in other states, too. And maybe some Democrats distancing themselves now amid the president's low approval rating. And I don't know if you caught the last part or not, but even the Democratic politicians are now afraid of meeting or appearing side by side with Joe Biden because his approval numbers are so bad. They're avoiding him. Absolute mess in Washington, D.C. And of course, the regular folks, the infrastructure of this country is paying the price. When it comes to Senator Manchin, he's already maxed out. The billionaire sponsors already maxed out their donations to Senator Manchin. And this is what it's all about. So once again, when it comes to the brothel, the risk is real. We have to price out at least two and a half trillion dollars out of the stock market that we have already priced in under the optimism of build back better. That's not going to happen now. Next, let's talk about China. When it comes to China, we have about five concerns, five main concerns. Number one, the real estate boom bust, specifically Evergrande. Number two, the slowing down of the Chinese economy. Number three, the protection in China against foreign companies, specifically U.S. companies. Number four, the crackdown against domestic companies in China. And lastly, number five, the tensions with Taiwan, the geopolitical tensions. Let's start with the first, which is the real estate crisis in China. Now, as you can see, now the crisis has reached extreme levels to the point where Chinese cities are now <laughs> selling land to themselves. And oh boy, we have a lot of bond maturities coming out this year for all of these real estate developers in China, which means, in all likelihood, a lot of them are going to default and start to collapse. Now, when we talk about the slowing down of the Chinese economy, a lot of the growth that we have priced in in the stock market, meaning the U.S. stock market, is based on the growth in China. When we talk about companies like Apple, Starbucks, Nike, etc. Well, we now know that the Chinese economy is slowing down dramatically. So we have to price out the prospects of growth that we have already priced in when it comes to the Chinese economy. That's another hammer against the stock market and the global economy. And to cement that, on Friday, we got stunning news from Caterpillar. Caterpillar reported earnings on Friday, and they have signaled that the demand from China has dropped down dramatically, and it will continue to drop down due to the real estate crisis in that country. There is a massive drop in construction. This has ripple impacts across the global economy. If the real estate sector in China is collapsing, it's going to hurt companies like Caterpillar, it's going to hurt commodities prices. It's going to hit banks and financial institutions that lend money to these companies. And it goes on and on. China is simply too big to fail. And perhaps the clearest sign that the Chinese economy is indeed on the brink of collapse is the fact that China is cutting interest rates to prop up the economy. But in doing so, they're risking that China is going to become another Turkey, where inflation sticks while the economy slows down, and hence the stagflation phenomenon. Now, when we talk about China and the backlash against foreign companies, it revolves around the geopolitical tensions, specifically in the region of Xinjiang, and now Walmart, Intel, and many other companies are facing massive backlash for defying the Chinese government in boycotting products from that particular region. And we're seeing many companies, the likes of Tesla, for example, opening stores and branches in Xinjiang to please the CCP and avoid any backlash. The problem is the tensions between China and the U.S. will accelerate significantly, be it because of Taiwan or even because of rare earth metals, which we've been importing from China for a long time now. The problem is it is becoming a national security issue and the U.S. is now proposing a bill that could block U.S. defense contractors from using Chinese rare earth metals. And there is a crisis to begin with in the rare earth metals market in China because prices are surging out of whack. There is immense demand 
for these metals, and there is very little supply. So China is cracking down against manufacturers. What are they going to do here? The demand is simply too high, and the supply is nowhere to be found. And the backlash extends to other foreign companies, not just US-based companies. For example, 7-Eleven, which is a Japanese company, was fined $7,000 for listing Taiwan as a country. And folks, this will continue to go on and on and on. Matter of fact, Chinese citizens, we covered the stunning revelations from Nike's earnings that the Chinese consumers are shunning Nike's products and many other American products. And now Chinese citizens are slamming Elon Musk, who was a darling of the CCP and the Chinese population not so long ago. Now wait till they start banning Teslas in China. That is the next shoe to drop. When it comes to the Chinese crackdown against domestic companies, look no further than the performance of Chinese stocks. They're getting absolutely hammered. The worst performing stocks in 2021 when it comes to the regional giants and a lot of U.S.-based investors lost millions, if not billions of dollars worth of investment in these Chinese stocks. And folks, once again, this channel has been ahead of everybody else by saying avoid investing in Chinese companies. And I said that back in December of 2020, once the crackdown against Alibaba started. And if you heeded that warning and followed my advice, you've avoided a ton of losses because the crackdown is just starting here. Because Chinese President Xi is calling for more measures against quote-unquote unhealthy development of the digital economy. And yes, the drop in Chinese stocks is creating a lot of value. We are seeing some famed value investors, the likes of legendary investor Charlie Munger, taking the opportunity of buying the dip in these Chinese stocks, specifically Alibaba. Munger might turn out to be right, but the risk is simply too high here for individual investors to buy the dip in these Chinese stocks. For all you know, Xi Jinping could break down Alibaba. And then what happens? When we talk about the Chinese domestic crackdown, it is also culturally we're seeing fines against celebrities, Chinese celebrities, who show signs of exuberance. For example, we're seeing even the cult classic movie, Fight Club, being censored in China, where they changed the ending to make it seem that the cops won. The government won at the end of the movie, ruining the ending of one of the most rebellious, most anti-tyranny movies in history. Now, when it comes to the geopolitical tensions between China and Taiwan, we've already talked about the sensitivity regarding the chip issue. Taiwan is one of the largest manufacturers of chips. The invasion of Taiwan will be absolutely disastrous in a global economy that is already suffering from a shortage of chips. But we are also seeing an interesting phenomenon, the rise of Chinese leadership in the world and the demise of U.S. leadership in the world. For example, the country of Lithuania launched relationships with Taiwan, and Taiwan rewarded Lithuania with over $1 billion worth of credit funds to support the Lithuanian economy. Now, the U.S. government did not support Lithuania's decision of getting closer to Taiwan. But what happened is Beijing, China, bullied Lithuania by proposing sanctions and economic hardships against Lithuania. What do you know, it didn't take long before Lithuania backed off and said, you know what, we're going to bow down to Beijing. And this is a clear illustration of the lack of leadership from the United States of America in the global arena. And now China is bullying any other country that gets closer to Taiwan, the latest being Slovenia. Now, when countries across the globe realize that by forging relationships with Taiwan, they're going to receive a massive backlash and bullying campaign from Beijing, they're going to back off, specifically when they know that the United States will not have their backs. In summary, the situation in China remains alarming, and it is one of the most active items on the wall of worry that could crash the stock market any moment be it the collapse of the real estate market in China, be it a backlash against U.S.-based companies, specifically giants, the likes of Apple, Nike, Starbucks, Tesla, and the rest, or be it an invasion of Taiwan. Any of these will rattle the stock market like you've never seen before. So this remains an active threat on the wall of worry. What about Russia, Ukraine? What's going on there in the Russian front. Another alarming front in the wall of worry. We know that inflation is surging out of whack in Russia. And despite the interest rate hikes by the Bank of Russia, inflation continues to rise higher. And the reason is inflation has always, always been a monetary phenomenon. When we talk about a monetary phenomenon, we're talking about the Federal Reserve. Despite what the Bank of Russia is going to do or any other bank is about to do, if the Federal Reserve remains accommodative and doesn't raise interest rates, commodities prices will continue to move higher. 
despite interest rate hikes by other banks, and inflation will continue to move higher. And now that President Putin of Russia is facing immense pressure due to the inflation crisis in Russia, perhaps he is launching a distraction by invading Ukraine and cementing his power. Here in the US, few missteps happen in this front. President Biden said that his guess is Putin will launch an offensive against Ukraine and quote unquote, he has to do something. Wow. And then the president slipped on live TV and said that Russia would not be punished for a minor incursion in Ukraine. The White House immediately scrambled to clarify, and even the Ukrainian president was livid saying that there is no such thing as a minor incursion. And then the White House came out to clean the mess. They sent this guy. Wasn't this guy supposed to be the coffee guy who delivers fast food and coffee to the office? Well, now he's saying that he's warning of severe economic consequences if Russia invades Ukraine. And I say, look at this guy. Are you scared of this guy? Absolutely not, unless he's an alien in a human form. But regardless, we're seeing a massive advancement here by Russia on the Ukrainian borders. Matter of fact, President Biden now says that there is a distinct possibility that Russia will invade Ukraine in February. And perhaps there is a good reason for delaying the invasion, and this reason is the Beijing Olympics. Perhaps President Putin doesn't want to upset his friend, President Xi, and he's going to wait till the Winter Olympics is over. Yet we're seeing alarming signs here. For example, the transportation of blood supplies to the borders between Russia and Ukraine, signaling that yes, an invasion is imminent, an invasion will happen regardless. And why do we care about all of this from a macroeconomics perspective and from a stock market perspective? We care because an invasion of Ukraine by Russia will be devastating to the global economy from an inflation picture. Everything could go higher. The prices of energy, be it natural gas, crude oil, even cars. Don't forget that Russia is one of the biggest producers of palladium and the everything metal, aluminum. On top of that, food prices could surge higher because Russia is one of the biggest producers, at least in that particular region, of wheat and soybeans. And you can see the correlation between aluminum prices in car prices. You can also see the correlation between wheat prices and bread prices. So an invasion could push inflation way higher than expectations, and this would be devastating for the stock market and the global economy because it ties in with the Fed's policy, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But another wrinkle when it comes to the tensions between Russia and Ukraine is where Germany stands. See, the Germans are looking at this from a macro economics perspective. They need gas, and Russia is one of the largest suppliers of natural gas. There is a pipeline between Russia and Germany, and why not just import gas from Russia? What's the big deal here? According to the Germans, they're baffled. They don't understand why the U.S. is so hot so about the pipeline between Russia and Germany. And this is a real test of the NATO alliance, matter of fact, the geopolitical alliances when it comes to Russia versus the U.S. For example, we heard that Germany blocked NATO ally Estonia from transporting military equipment to Ukraine, and that was the alarming sign number one. And then came the commentary from the Navy chief in Germany, who pretty much reiterated that Germany is confused here. What is the big deal? Why are we causing this war? Why are we going to this war? Just let Russia to flow gas all the way to Germany. What's the big deal here? And of course, the heat was on when the Navy chief, and he resigned right away. And now that the efforts from the White House has failed to prop up natural gas production from allies the likes of Qatar to the EU, the only option available is flowing gas from the country of Azerbaijan through Turkey all the way to the European Union. And this is not a convenient choice here, but it is the last resort. It's not going to be enough. If an invasion happens, natural gas prices will spike higher, and this will push inflation expectations higher and higher and higher prompting a reaction from the Fed. And speaking of, here's the next item in the wall of worry, the hawk, the Federal Reserve, which is turning hawkish, not by choice, because if it was up to them, they will prop up assets prices forever. But they are forced to be hawkish because inflation is surging out of control. Matter of fact, on Friday, we got the PCE inflation, which is the Fed's favorite measure of inflation, and the reason is it waters down the true nature of inflation. But even with that, the reading that we got on Friday was at 40-year high. PCE inflation at almost 6% year over year. If you look at commodities prices, they're already at all-time highs. The commodities index has reached all-time highs, meaning food prices are higher, energy prices are higher, 
Metals prices are higher, grains prices are higher, everything is higher. The consumer is bearing the brunt of the pain here. And this is the danger from all of this. If the Fed is tightening while the pace of economic growth is still intact, then the damage will be minimal because inflation will cool off and yes, the pace of growth will cool off, but the damage will be contained. The risk here is, if inflation continues to grow higher while the pace of economic growth continues to slump and the Fed will have no choice but to tighten while the economy is contracting. A dire scenario, the worst case scenario for the Fed, and this is already happening before our eyes. On Friday, the U.S. consumer spending dropped dramatically. Unbelievable drop in U.S. consumer spending. And this is the pace of economic growth shrinking while inflation continues to linger. And this is the biggest drop in U.S. consumer spending since February of last year. You can see the correlation. As inflation rises higher, consumer spending is getting crushed. It is not a surprise that the consumer sentiment is also dropping like a rock. We were told that we're going to have a V-shaped recovery after the pandemic. And I ask, where is the V-shaped recovery? Look at consumer sentiment dropping like a rock, as if we're already in a recession. And here comes the delusional New York Times asking, growth is surging in Biden's economy. Why don't voters feel better? Question mark. And this is from the genius Gianna Smilik, who previously wrote an article asking, will wage growth win? Or will inflation win? A dumb question showing that the person has to go back to school. In no inflationary period in history has wage growth defeated inflation. Never. It's always the opposite. Inflation surpasses wage inflation and net-net workers are losing money. So when the New York Times asks, why don't voters feel better? Perhaps because workers are losing money. Inflation gave U.S. workers a pay cut last year, and it could get even worse this year. And now all of a sudden, the Fed insider traders criminals, after they dumped at the top, of course, they're all turning hawkish, including the demon from Minneapolis, who says it is time to walk the walk and increase interest rates in March. Matter of fact, Atlanta Fed President Boystick says, how about a half a point raise in March? We were expecting 25 basis points. Boystick says, how about 50 basis points? Oh boy, that would crush the stock market like you've never seen before. And this is, of course, anchoring market expectations for now 50 basis points in March. Matter of fact, market expectations right now is pricing in four interest rates in the bag. And these expectations are moving higher and higher and higher by the day. We're now pricing in over five interest hikes. And even Goldman Sachs says, expect five interest rate hikes this year. And Bank of America takes it up a notch by saying, expect seven interest rate hikes. Oh boy. And here's the most alarming fact. You would think if the economy is growing, as the New York Times says, and the economy is in the best shape in years, perhaps decades, that interest rate hikes should support a steeper yield curve. If the economy is healthy and the pace of economic growth is intact, that interest rate hikes hikes should push the yield curve to become steeper, meaning the 30 years bond should pay more than the 20, and the 20 should pay more than the 10, and the 10 should pay more than the 2. You get the point. This is what the yield curve looks like in a healthy economy. Not what we're seeing right now. We're seeing the yield curve flattening, meaning the 20 year is now paying more than the 30, and soon enough, the 10 is going to pay more than the 20 and the 30, and before you know it, the curve is going to invert, and the 2 year will pay more than the 10. And you and I know that every single time in history when the yield curve has inverted, it was always, always an accurate predictor of an upcoming recession. But we got another ominous sign, perhaps a preview of what's about to happen when the Federal Reserve holds its meeting in March. And this time around, it comes from Colombia. Because Colombia stunned the economists on Friday with bigger than expected key rate hike. They went to 4 percent abruptly. And the reason is inflation is surging out of whack in Colombia. And as you can see, banks across the globe, with the exception of China and Turkey, are jacking interest rates higher to combat this inflation. And look at this punchable face right there with the gloves. And it says, stock investors know not to fight the Fed. But you can fight the Fed model. This is all garbage, of course. In this channel, you can go back in my videos. I said the Fed is wrong about the transitory theory about inflation. Inflation is going to go way higher than expectations. And therefore, fight the Fed. 
fight the Fed, double down on your inflation bets, buy oil, buy grains, buy commodities, softs, aluminum, zinc, double down on these inflationary plays because inflation will surge out of whack and it is time to fight the Fed when the Fed is delusional. And then I released a video not so long ago when the Fed started to become hawkish and I said be careful buying the dip here because you don't want to fight the Fed. When the Fed is hawkish. All of you have been saying, hey, when the market was going higher, irrationally, don't fight the Fed. The Fed is accommodative. The Fed is greasing the market with trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars worth of drugs, stimulating the stock market, which is, by the way, a zombie stock market that should have never traded at these insane valuations. But the Fed's cocaine supported the insane action that we saw in the stock market. And back then, the bulls been saying, hey, don't fight the Fed. Okay, you were right. Now the Fed is changing policy. So why are you fighting the Fed? Next, let's talk about the thing. And I got to be careful here because I got in trouble before, you know, in this uh, dystopian censorship, big tech tyranny that we're living in. I got to be careful. But here's the thing about the thing. The media has not been objective at all. It has been a propaganda machine been playing politics and that's all there is they've politicized a tragedy look for example at these headlines from vanity fair back in 2020 they said that the orange clown rushed to release a thing miracle and we have to play with the words here so we don't trigger the robot police so when i say miracle it means the the thing that was supposed to cure the thing but anyways they said that america is worried about the rush to produce the miracle and then fast forward a year later they say the rights war on the things miracle mandates is about to get scary so you went from america's worried to let's force everybody to have it another one the daily beast a disgusting publication in 2020 they said that the miracle passports our big tech's latest dystopian nightmare. And then, fast forward next year, and all of a sudden the same publication says, Biden's workplace miracle mandate is legal, moral, and wise. Wow. And of course, disgusting articles in this filth that we call the Daily Beast. They say that the Pokemon shows that the unmiracled will never be safe. Oh really? How about the children who did not get the miracle? They're not at risk. They're more at risk from slipping in a banana peel than dying from the thing. It facts, science, rationale, that doesn't matter at all. It's all about politics here. It's all about corporate profits. And they have brainwashed a significant portion of the population to turn against each other and blame the other side for their woes, instead of blaming the incompetency of the so-called leaders. When we talk about the Daily Beast, who is the editor at large of this filthy publication? It is Noah Skantamamamo, who cares? Who happens to be a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institution, part of the satanic cult. Who's the funder? Of the Brookings Institution? The answer is, how about the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation? How about J.P. Morgan Chase and David Rubenstein? And oh, by the way, the owner of the Daily Beast is IAC, which happens to be owned by billionaire Barry Diller, who's all in for miracle passports. Notice that every publication we have is owned by a billionaire. There is no such thing as free press in this country anymore. Another one. What about Foreign Policy Magazine? Here it is. In 2020, it says the Orange Clown's uh, miracle cannot be trusted. Fast forward a year later, and the headline reads from the same publication, The whole world needs uh, miracles before a worse variant than the D arrives. So it went from cannot be trusted to the entire world needs to get the miracle. Okay, and I told you in this channel back in September that we have yet to see the peak of the thing and inflation. What do you know? Inflation continued to move higher and the thing stunned everybody. An infection rose to all time highs. And I told you back in November, again, when Dr. Shu Polish Gottlieb, who was in the pocket of Pfizer, came out and said, the thing will end in January. Look at him, smile ear to ear. And I said, bullshit, you haven't seen the end of this movie yet. Cases will surge to all-time highs. And indeed, this is what happened. Cases went to all-time highs, dwarfing the previous two waves. And again, I'm not a virologist, I'm not an epidemiologist, I'm not a geologist, I'm just a douchebagologist on YouTube. And I got it right yet again. Why? Because I read the data with no bias. I don't care where my conclusion lands in the political spectrum. Just study the facts, apply rationale, 
and let the chips fall wherever they may. And all you need to know to come up with a conclusion that the draconian efforts are not going to work is this. And this is back from September. According to the Washington Post, Portugal has nearly ran out of people to give the miracle. What happens next? Question mark. Now, here in the US, they've been telling you and I that if everybody gets the miracle, we're going to be fine. The thing will die and we will go back to normal. And that could not be any further from the truth because this is what happened right away in the country of Portugal. Right now, as we speak, they have the highest cases ever since the whole saga began. And this is despite the fact that they gave the miracle to about 104% of the population. Once again, 104% of the population. So are you convinced now or are you going to continue to be brainwashed and blame other people for your misery, even though the facts and the science do not support that at all? There is somebody to blame, but it's not your fellow neighbor. It's not your family member. It's not your co-worker. It's the m****ers on top. That's who should be blamed. And it doesn't matter what the Supreme Court says. The cult is continuing to support defying the constitution of this country and the rule of law. For example, today, among many other companies, T-Mobile said to hell with the Supreme Court. If you are an employee and you do not get the miracle, you're going to lose your job. You're going to lose your income and perhaps face homelessness. For what? Risking public health? If that was true, then how do you explain the data from Portugal? Or is it a failure of compliance? Because that's what it's all about. Today, we got another one. Another senator who got the miracle three times, yet contracted the thing. So again, what is the point here in these draconian measures? Is it really about public safety and health? Or is it about compliance? You have been brainwashed to believe that if you support these draconian measures to violate and crush other people, that by doing so, you're sticking it to the orange clown. They brainwashed you to do that. But what do you know? The orange clown is actually a cheerleader for the miracle. He actually wants to be credited as the inventor of the miracle. So again, who are you fighting against? Who are you trying to oppress here? This is like the AMC apes and the GameStop morons who wanted to stick it to the man. And they ended up sticking it in their own ass. Are any of you who supported the suppression of this channel because of things that I said in the past about the thing, which all, by the way, turned out to be true, and you made the nasty comments, unsubscribe, this channel has took a downturn, yada, yada, yada. Are you going to apologize now? Of course not, because the suppression has absolutely crushed this channel. The RPM, meaning what this channel makes from producing videos, went down by 20 five percent and the only reason this channel continues to grow is the fact that you the audience continue to press the like button continue to share continue to comment and keep the engagement alive otherwise this channel would be dead by now because the algos are not doing us any favors at all but are these people gonna apologize to me of course not because it's all about ego and being brainwashed and here's who you're hurting it's not the orange clown it's this inflation, the poor, the middle class, the truckers, etc, etc. Because truckers are refusing to comply here and this is exacerbating the shortage of truckers, which is worsening the shortages and supplies of food. And as a result, food prices are moving higher. When food prices move higher, does it impact the rich? Of course not. It falls heavily on the poor. The poor is starving and food prices continue to move higher with no stop in sight. How about the destruction of the young generation in this country? The headline reads from the Washington Post, colleges lost 465,000 students this fall, and the continued erosion of enrollment is raising the alarm. We're seeing depression sky high among young folks quitting college. They want to live their lives. They want to have the college experience, and they're not having that. And a lot of students have delayed their education journey until the thing is over. And it's been two years now. And a lot of them, and I talk to a lot of them, by the way, they say, you know what? It's been two years. I feel too dumb to go back to college now. It's too late. We are destroying an entire generation of folks. And by doing so, we're short on college graduates. And this is exacerbating the labor shortage in this country, pushing inflation higher and higher and higher. What about small businesses? Is the draconianism hurting Facebook, Amazon, Target, Walmart? Of course not. It is hurting small businesses the most. One third of small businesses have seen revenue drops and this percentage is surging higher. Small businesses cannot catch a break in this country anymore. They say upside down again, the Pokemon surge royals US small businesses. Late arriving product really kills us, says a small business owner. He also added, I've been 
been in this business for almost 20 years and have never encountered anything like this. Another one, just down the road, a junior's restaurant bakery, renowned for its cheesecakes. The owner, Alan Rosen, said he had suffered with supply chain issues and staffing shortages. He has sometimes had to rope off entire sections of his restaurants due to the labor shortage. No servers, you gotta rope it off. He also added that the costs of goods are through the roof. There is inflationary pressure. Supply chains are a mess. Another one, Mark Pechtol, who owns four Zisti whatever pizza wings shop, who cares, said he never dreamed his biggest nightmare as a small business owner would come in the form of supply chain issues. Quoting now, I do not know if I'm going to have pizza boxes at the end of the week. If I don't have pizza boxes, I'm going out of business. We're just holding our breath. And even if he can get pizza boxes, Pectol says he's already getting warnings about a possible flour shortage next. It never ends, folks. Unbelievable. And who's benefiting from all of this, by the way? How about Pfizer, who boosted their sales forecast last year to $33.5 billion, but it gets even better. They had to revise the forecast and upgrade it to $36 billion. When are you going to wake up, folks? When? When you look at the wall of worry, all in all, the threat from the fiscal policy is here. We have to price out at least $2.5 trillion out of the stock market. When we look at the risk of China, it is immense. We're holding our breath here. Anything could happen. Any moment, the shoe could drop from China. When it comes to Russia and Ukraine, the threat is alive. An invasion will push inflation out of control again. And that leads us to the Fed. The Fed is already hawkish and already talking about a 50 basis points increase in March alone. If an invasion happens, pushing crude oil prices above 100 and natural gas prices prices above five or six bucks again, it's going to be, what, three quarters points increase? How about a full point? You think the stock market can handle that? Of course not. And when it comes to the thing and the way government's been handling this, it only added the inflation woes. Specifically, when it comes to small businesses, it added more in pushing inflation expectations higher by exacerbating the supply chain woes. Folks, the bottom line is the wall of worry is simply too high to climb right now. Anyhow, we have to move on and cover the market for you. And we start with the market performance last week. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average on Friday closed in the green big by 564.69 points or a gain of 1.65%. The Nasdaq also surged higher by 417.79 points or a gain of 3.13%. Wow. The S&P 500 also closed in the green by 105.34 points or a gain of 2.43%. And what about the sector's performance on Friday? Leading the pack at number one and capturing the gold medal, technology, number two for the silver, REITs, and number three for the bronze, communication services. The laggard of the day on Friday was energy. Now, let's contrast this with the weekly performance. Coming up at number one, capturing the gold medal, energy, number two for the silver, financials, number three for the bronze, technology. Meanwhile, the laggards of the week were led by cyclicals, materials, and industrials. What about the advance to decline ratios on Friday? The NYSE, 74% advancing versus 22% declining. The NASDAQ, 69% advancing versus 26% declining. A recovery... A big boost, a big rebound on Friday. The problem is, is it going to stick or not? Because the negativity, as I've showed you from the wall of worry, remains too high. Moving on to commodities, futures. Massive upside day for energy futures. We're talking about crude oil prices. The WTI, Brent, all moved higher by about 1% apiece. And likewise, gasoline prices went higher along with heating oil with modest gains on Friday, while natural gas exploded higher with gains of 9.5% on Friday alone. And I've been predicting this, by the way, natural gas prices will explode higher again, be it the tensions between Russia and Ukraine, or be it the severe winter storms we're having in the northeast of this country. What about softs? Lumber is recovering and regaining 1,000 once again. Lumber closed with over 3% gains on Friday. 
We also have decent gains for coffee, cotton, and cocoa. While we have steep declines for OJ over 6%, I believe this is due to the market mechanics. We're getting closer to the contract's expiration. We're seeing some profit taking here. Stick around. I got news for you for OJ in a second. But here it is. Sugar is down also 1%. We'll cover that in a minute in commodities news. But before we do that, what about metals? Gold on the flat line, while well, we have declines for silver, platinum, and copper. Copper was down big, over 2% on Friday, while the tailwinds for palladium remain intact specifically the tensions between Russia and Ukraine. What about meats? Big upside day for live cattle, gains of over 1%, while feeder cattle futures close in the flat line and lean hogs with modest gains of almost half a percentage point. What about grains? Green across the board, be it soybeans, corn, wheat, oats, canola, all moving higher, while rough rice pretty much on the flat line. Here are some commodities news for you. Sugar futures gave up the gains and moved down again due to the supply outlook. We have an abundant supply, at least for now, in sugar. OJ went down, I do believe, due to the mechanics of the market, not to the supply-demand dynamics. We actually have a severe shortage of orange juice in this country. Despite Friday's declines, OJ prices remain sky-high from the bottom. We're paying more now. We have a severe inflation in orange juice prices. And the reason is we have the smallest crop since World War II, 1945. And it got even worse with the frost in Florida. Take a look. It's no secret grocery prices are on the rise. Fruit and vegetable prices went up by 5% in 2021. Now, Florida's famous orange juice may soon be in shorter supply, making breakfast more expensive as well. CBS's Manuel Bajorquez is in Umatilla, Florida, where orange growers are feeling the squeeze. See all that? That's all next year's crop right there. At one of his groves outside Orlando, Brian Farina showed us what a healthy orange tree looks like. That's what you want. Yep, so this is what we want. And what a tree plagued by citrus greening looks like. So it kills it from the inside. Yeah, all the roots are going to go first. Wow. So when you have no roots, you have no leaves, no fruit. Some trees don't die, but produce oranges that are smaller, green, and have less sugar. Not as sweet, harder to sell, and bad for business. There is no known cure for citrus greening. In fact, in groves like this one, it's safe to assume most trees have some degree of it. One telltale sign, the amount of fruit that's fallen to the ground or is unusually small. Here's how hard Florida's orange crop is getting squeezed. At its peak, the state produced more than 244 million boxes of oranges a year. This year, it's forecast to produce only 44.5 million. Prices for orange juice concentrate rose nearly 14 percent in the last year amid strong demand during the coronavirus pandemic. And the low crop yield will likely drive prices even higher in 2022. So again, the expectations are OJ prices will recover and move higher again. The tailwinds are still intact for prices to climb higher. And the temperatures in Florida moved down dramatically this morning. There were warnings that iguanas might fall from trees in Florida. Let me know if that actually happened or not, if you happen to live in Florida. Moving on to the options market, the big casino, what's going on here? What happened on Friday? The hottest table by far is Apple. Watch out for the volume here, moving higher again, which is a good sign for the bulls. Apple closing the day with almost 2.5 million contracts traded on Friday alone. About 58% of those were calls. At number 2, Tesla, the souffle, with a little over 950,000 contracts traded for the name of Friday. About 50% of those were calls. At number 3, Robinhood, with about half a million contracts that exchanged hands on Friday. About 46% of those were calls. Moving on to the unusual activities that took place in the options market on Friday. We start with the ticker ASHR. This is the Chinese ETF. They are making an upside bet here by buying the 38 calls for the expiration date April 14th. With the expectations that the name could pop higher by more than 5.5% by then. They paid about 65 cents apiece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about $6 million. What about the trade for the ticker I? WM boy, the charts don't look good here, and somebody's betting for massive declines to come in the Russell 2000. They're buying the 182 puts for the expiration date, February 18th, with the expectation.
expectations. The IWM could drop down by more than 7% by then. They paid about two bucks and a half a piece to enter this trade, all in all, spending about $15 million. What about the trades for the ticker VXX? This is a VIX proxy. Somebody's betting the volatility will cool down in the next few days. It's a spread. A put spread they bought the 18 and a half puts and they sold the 17 and a half puts so the profit limit here is one buck a piece now they paid about one buck and 20 cents a piece for buying the 18 and a half bucks puts and they received about 80 cents a piece from selling the 17 and a half puts all in all their entry cost is reduced to about 40 cents a piece and again the maximum profit is one buck a piece so you can make about 150 percent profit from this trade if it works and all in all they spent about half a million dollars but the message is important here somebody's betting that the vix will cool down and if you look at the charts the indicators say that indeed the vix will cool down what about the trade for the ticker SPY for the S&P 500? They continue to buy puts here. In this case, the 400 puts for the expiration date, February 18th, with the expectations that the name could pop higher by more than 9.5% by then. They paid about 3 bucks a piece to enter this trade, all in all, spending about $3 million. And lastly, what about the trade for the ticker TWTR Twitter? They're buying upside calls here, the 40 bucks calls for the expiration date, April 14th, with the expectations that the name could pop higher by more than 13.5% by then. They paid about two bucks a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about two million dollars. Moving on to the heat map analysis. This is the heat map from Friday's activities. Everything is lighting up green. A rebound rally, the tide that lifts all boats. We've been talking about this for a while now. Technology up, financials up, healthcare, cyclicals, REITs, everything is up. With the exception of energy, we're seeing some profit taking here after Chevron's earnings. Yet the move is not significant in the grand scheme of things because the tailwinds for energy prices to continue to move higher are still intact. Yet the technicals in oil stocks have gotten too extended to the upside, meaning overbought, quote unquote, and therefore we're seeing fading the rip in energy and then buying the dip in technology where we're seeing severe oversold, quote unquote, conditions. Now, when we contrast the daily heat map with the weekly one, this is what we get. The picture is not as rosy. We're seeing massive losses here, specifically regarding earnings. Tesla down over 10%, AT&T down big, Intel down over 8%, Caterpillar, Triple M, the ticker NEE, Next Era Energy and Utilities down big, over 12% for the week. Yet we're seeing some positive reactions to earnings. Be it Visa, be it Lockheed Martin, the ticker LMT, be it Big Pharma, be it CVS, be it ServiceNow in software, the ticker NW or NOW, excuse me, be it Apple, be it Microsoft, but the gains are limited here. And at some point, we're going to have a theme. And the consistent theme has been energy moving higher technology moving down. Let's move on to the charts analysis and wrap it up. We start with a 30 minutes chart for the SPY, the S&P 500. What do we have here? The important message right now is 430. This is the line in the sand. Why? It has been retested over and over and over and over again throughout the week. And then it produced the pop on Friday. This charting behavior tells us that 430 is an important level. You do not want to lose 430. If 430 is lost, run for the hills. Grab your diapers, grab the wife, the kids, the dogs, and get the hell out there because we will see another flush down. Now, if 430 is held, and it should, at least for now, then we have the support at 438, and we have the resistance at around 443. How far can we go, you might ask? I say this is not the right question. The right question is, can we hold the gains that we got on Friday? Because when we switch to the daily chart of the continuous contract for the SPY, the S&P 500, the good news is we're now above 4,384 and a half. This is the support. The momentum indicators are moving higher in an attempt to reverse the negative divergence. All of these are good signs for the bulls that perhaps we're seeing a bottoming process in the SPY, the S&P 500. Likewise, when we talk about the volume, it remains elevated, but it is off the highs. Another good sign for the bulls, but you gotta be careful because the volume did not go down in a significant way. Opening the door, then we could see another flush down all the way to retest 4,232. I told you before, if we go down there again, in all likelihood, it's not gonna hold. Here's the worrisome signs, perhaps what the bears are looking at. 
when we switch to a weekly chart of the SPX, the cash index of the SPY, the S&P 500, we had a tradable channel with defined highs and defined lows, a defined range, all the way since the bottom of 2020. This range has been broken to the downside, and this is always always a negative sign that the trend is over it has been broken and in a typical charting behavior the chart will reattempt to recapture the trend but in all likelihood once you break a long trend a strong trend that has been going on for a while the break is for good and we will have lower lows in no time whether we have the retest of the lower range of the channel or not sooner or later this chart will go down to visit 4000 once again when we switch to the daily chart for the SPX same chart just the daily perspective this time around and I'm showing you the 200 days moving average despite Friday's gains we have yet to close above the 200 days moving average so the bears will argue that all what we're forming right now is a bear flag formation until and unless we close above the 200 days moving average absent of that who's to say that the formation is not going to play out and we will see another flush down all the way to 4000 moving on to the cues 30 minutes chart what's going on here as we've talked with the SPY the S&P 500 the important level in this chart is 343 you can argue it's 342 and a half doesn't matter to me it's a zone after all but you don't want this zone to be broken because it held on over and over and over again and finally produced the pop on friday if that level is broken folks we have lower lows to visit here but for now we're looking at the support of 343 and the resistance at 352 moving on to the daily chart for the continuous contract for the Qs, the Nasdaq. The good news is we're trading above 14,000. We retested that level over and over and over again, and the chart bounced from that point. The next level of capture is 14,445. And the good news for the bulls, once again, the volume is moderating. It remains elevated, but it's still off the highs. Likewise, the momentum indicators are curling upward. They're recovering some of the negative divergence that has been going on since November, by the way. But here is the bad news for the bulls, and the good news for the bears and we'll look at the ndx the nasdaq 100 this is a weekly chart as we've talked with the spx we have a defined channel ups and downs peaks and valleys and we saw what it appears to be a false breakout to the upside and indeed it was now in typical charting behavior when you have a false breakout one way or the other the real breakout will happen in the opposite direction and this is exactly what we're seeing in the chart of the nasdaq this is an ominous sign folks we have negative divergence on the hour side from weekly perspective we have the macd indicator curling downward producing red impressions on the histogram and these impressions are getting larger and larger what does that mean sooner or later despite the relief rally this baby is going down let's visit a daily chart perspective for the ndx we're way below the 200 days moving average now we can retrace the 200 days moving average in a relief rally and get rejected from there or we can go all the way to retrace the lower edge of the channel and then get rejected from there to illustrate this for you here's a daily chart for the queues the qqqs which we seldom cover in this channel at least from the daily chart perspective because in my opinion it is irrelevant you gotta look at the continuous contract when you look from a daily chart perspective but regardless to illustrate what I'm seeing here, we had a trend line that goes all the way back to September of 2020. That trend line was broken this month. This is an ominous sign, but in typical charting behavior, once the trend is broken, you don't see a flush down, a crash right away. You see steep declines and then a reattempt to recapture the trend line. And then in all likelihood, the reattempt will be met with failure and we will see the next shoe to drop, the next leg, the next flush down that will produce a lower low moving on to a 30 minutes chart for the iwm the russell 2000 what's going on here my line in the sand is 191 and a half closing the day below that line will be a severe ominous signal if you believe that the russell 2000 is a leading indicator breaking that level will mean that the rest of the market the spy and the queues will also break their important levels that we just talked about for now the support remains 191 and a half the resistance of 196 and a half and here's a weekly chart for the rut the russell 2000 again we had a defined consolidation range between 2100 and 2360 we had what it appears to be a false breakout to the upside and then we had the confirmation that it is indeed a false breakout what does that mean in typical charting behavior 
the real breakout will happen in the opposite direction. And this is exactly what we're seeing right now. Also, in typical charting behavior, once the breakout happened, there is a retracement, meaning the chart could move higher in a relief rally in a short covering rally to retrace 2100 as resistance. Then it gets rejected and we have a lower low, another flush down from that point on. So keep that in mind. The weekly charts, the monthly charts remain extremely bearish across the market, be it the SPY, the Qs, the Russell, yet the daily charts hold some hope for the bulls that we could see a relief oversold rally in these indices. Moving on to the Dixie, the dollar index, a daily chart, what's going on here? A massive move higher, but you gotta remember this. We're not gonna hear from Jerome Powell again till March. We're not gonna have market moving macro data till Friday when we get the unemployment report. And then I believe on February 10th, the CPI. But until then, we don't have any market moving macro data. So we could see the overbought conditions in the Dixie playing out, or we could see a pullback perhaps all the way to retest 97 as support or even 96 once again. The pop in the dollar was not good for gold. Gold suffered losses this week, yet the good news is it remains trading above 1,763 my line in the sand, and if the dollar eases, we could see gold catching a rally too. Moving on, the 10-year yield, a daily chart, what's going on here? Are we seeing a double top formation you combine that with elevated momentum indicators be it the rsi or the macd we could read the tea leaves here and see the 10-year yield moving down perhaps to revisit 1.7 percent or even below that and if that happens we could see an extension of the relief rally in the nasdaq moving on to the tlt bond prices from weekly chart perspective again it is a negative candle but it was a lot worse in the beginning of the week the good news is it closed pretty much at the highs of last week's candle. We're identifying 140 as support because it held over and over and over again as resistance and once again as support. Could we see the TLT moving higher to retest 149 as resistance once again and then it pulls back from that point on and that could come hand in hand with a pullback in the 10 year yield and a rally in the NASDAQ? This is certainly what I'm looking for this week. What about the VIX? A four hours chart perspective. Look at the MACD indicator. It is negative. It is producing red impressions on the histogram. This is your indicator that the VIX is topping and therefore the SPY is bottoming. And look at how the resistance at 33 has been holding over and over and over and over again, which is strengthening my outlook that this could be a reverse ABC pattern that could take us, keyword could, all the way to revisit the important level of support of 20. If that happens, we will see a massive pop in the SPY, the continuation of the relief rally. Here's another fun fact for you. Bloomberg says, perhaps it is time to bet against the VIX. This is at least what history suggests. And the reason is, the VIX moved higher seven days in a row, which only happened 10 times in the past two decades. So the probabilities say, it's not going to hold for longer than that. It's a rarity. And in all likelihood, the VIX will pull back. We're not saying that the VIX is going to collapse and it's over. I'm saying the VIX will pull back and then it will rebound again, producing higher highs we will see the SPY and the Qs producing lower lows. What about the VXN, the VIX for the NASDAQ? Once again, a four hours perspective. We now have a confirmation from the MACD indicator crossing to the negative territory, producing red impressions on the histogram indicating that the VXN has indeed topped. We're seeing a bear flag pattern. It is already playing out to the downside. We're seeing negative divergence on the RSI indicator. All signs are pointing out that the VXN has topped and the NASDAQ is bottoming for now. Keyword. For now, here's a daily chart for Apple. After a double rejection from the upper range of the channel, the earnings report did the trick. It moved the stock higher to pass above the channel. And we're now looking at around 172.5 for resistance. Could Apple move higher, face resistance from that point on, and then move to the downside? You got to keep in mind that Apple is going to pay dividend next week. It's not a big deal. Nobody buys Apple for dividends. But it could play as a headwind that pulls Apple to the downside. And if that happens, perhaps we could see the end of the relief rally this fast. We'll see. What about Tesla, the souffle, an hourly chart? Not looking good here. It broke below the trend line. 
from the daily chart perspective, but it did not recover that trend line despite the rally on Friday. Not a good sign for Tesla here. When we look at the daily chart, again, the trend line has been broken, but we have yet to recover the trend line. In all likelihood, when you break the trend line, after a massive divergence to the upside, in all likelihood, you're going to see the divergence extending to the downside this time around. Another bad sign for the souffle. The weekly chart perspective. We're seeing lower highs. We're seeing the trend being broken. We're seeing negative divergence. On the RSI and the MACD indicators. Despite whatever relief rally we're about to get, this chart is going down. You gotta be careful here. Either you take profits or consider buying some protection here, either by selling upside calls on any relief rally or by buying puts to protect your investment if you are a shareholder in Tesla. Lastly, what about Tulips, BTC, Bitcoin? I don't like this. I don't like it at all. The chart is struggling to move higher. The chart is struggling to find buyers. Remember, it's asking any buyers, any buyers, any buyers. If the buyers don't show up by this week, the bear flag will play out and you will see the support of 35,750 broken. And before you know it, the chart will be reading 30,000, if not below. So watch out here. The performance of cryptos is really important from a sentiment perspective. Lastly, we're moving on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? We have the Chicago PMI and a bunch of Fed zombies speaking. Who cares? Anyhow, folks, I'm done here. This is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I will talk to you again tomorrow.